Can we see you? Okay, Clara, you are okay. live. Okay, all right, so let's start. So good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, or good night mm -hmm. to everyone, <laughs> depending on the time zone you're in. And as always, we have a, a really, really wide window of time zones since, uh, you know, Michelle Bouchard is in British Columbia and Takami is in Japan. So it's, uh, it's really quite uh, from, you know, 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. So anyway. Yes. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you very much for all the participants who accepted to be part of this webinar on HME in World Anthropologies. As you know, um, WCA has been organizing the seminars, this webinars, <laughs> since um, March 2020 when the pandemic started. And actually, this is a WCA webinar, but um, but it's a it's also a joint uh, or, um, event since WCA is now part of WOW, World Anthropological Union, together with IUAES, the International Union of Anthropological and Ethnological Sciences. This webinar, as Ricardo, uh, our, our communication um, member has explained, is being recorded. It will be available later on on the WCA WOW uh, website. And it's also being um, diffused through several uh, media which Ricardo just explained. And I want to especially thanks to all my colleagues at the WCA organizing committee who always helped me organizing this webinars, to Michelle Bouchard, who is the host at the University of Northern British Columbia, and to Ricardo Faguaga in Mexico, who is normally and always the person who makes this uh, technology, technology and technological uh, problems uh, disappear and make things work. So. This webinar today has um, as title Hegemony in World Anthropologies. We have proposed uh, a list of topics or themes that our participants may address, but of course they are also free to discuss other subtopics and themes. Basically, the questions or topics we set forth are uh, one, is there hegemony in, in the profession of anthropology? Two, if there is, is it Anglophone in general or more specifically US, United States? Three, again, if there is, how does it work and now how and what makes it work? And number four, if there isn't, what sustains the belief that it exists? Now, before uh, presenting our participants, I also wanted to um, just mention two things. One of them is the fact that um, we, we received this um, news from uh, AAA, well, from the American Anthropologist World Anthropologist sex section, a call for contributions um, to a section called call for complaint. And I think this makes sense to, it makes sense to uh, talk about it here because uh, the questions they arise have a lot to do with the topic that brings us here today. The, you know, they ask how are global academic power relations reflected in the everyday experiences of anthropologists around the world and how do we experience the privileging of academic production from Euro-American centers over non-hegemonic locations of anthropological thinking, et cetera, et cetera. So we can, Michelle can put it on the chat and everyone can access that. Uh, I think the deadline for contributions is January 2022, so um, you will be able to look at it on the chat or otherwise go to the AAA website. The second thing I wanted to mention before presenting the participants is actually not mentioning, is passing the word to my colleague uh, Gordon Matthews, uh, since there is the idea of creating a task force. So please, Gordon, can you please briefly explain what you have in mind? Sure. Uh, many of the people on this task force are highly eminent and you may not want to participate, but as the deputy chair of the WCA, I would love to have a task force on hegemony in world anthropology. This will entail putting together, oh, a 30 or 40 or 50 page manual of how practically hegemony can be overcome. Uh, as well as the intellectual background of this. So, uh, you know, if any of you were interested, what I will do is put in my email in the chats. Please write me. 
uh, we don't want to have 30 people here. We'd rather have a smaller number, but it would be terrific if you want to participate and we can all work together in putting together some concrete means for overcoming global hegemony, which is an enormous problem, as, as you all know. So I'll put my, my email in the chat room and please respond to me personally if you can. Thank you. Okay, Gordon, thank you very much. So I will now, um, without much more ado, I will uh, present our speakers for today. And as always, we will start from the east to the west. So we'll start with China and finish with Mexico. So um, our speakers are Takami Kuwayama, who received this degree at UCLA and taught at Virginia Commonwealth University for four years. His experiences in the United States and back in Japan made him aware of the power structure of academic practices. He discussed this issue in his 2004 book, Native Anthropology, The Japanese Challenge to Western Academic Hegemony. Hegemony. He currently teaches at Kwanzai Gakuin University and is professor emeritus as at Hokkaido University. Then the following will be James Gang Chen, who is chair professor and director of the Center for Social and Economic Behavior Studies at Yunnan University of Finance and Economics in China. He has an MA from Iowa University and a PhD from Ohio State University. And his research interests are in the areas of development anthropology and cultural tourism, globalization and cultural change amongst others. He's now the chief editor of the International Journal of Business Anthropology and the representative of Chinese Anthropological Society at the World Council of Anthropological Associations. Then we will have Hulf Hanertz, who is a professor emeritus of social anthropology at Stockholm University and a former chair of the European Association of Social Anthropologists, EASA. His research has been um, especially dominant in urban anthropology, media anthropology, and transnational cultural processes. He also did a work of uh, news media with foreign correspondents involved in field studies in Johannesburg, Jerusalem, and Tokyo. Shannon Moreira is a Zimbabwean born anthropologist who currently lives in Wulda and works in South Africa and teaches at the University of Cape Town. Her research is concerned with the impact of coloniality on knowledge systems in post-colonial and settler societies including human rights law and alternative forms of justice, of justice, land use, and higher education. She is best editor of the Anthropology Certain African Journal and is currently a co-editor of the Critical African Studies. Next will come Gonzalo Diaz Croveto, who is an anthropologist and has a PhD from the University of Brasilia in Brazil. He currently directs the Magister Program in Anthropology at the Catholic University of Tume Temuco where he also participates as a researcher at the, as, sorry, at the Intercultural and Inter-Ethnic Research Center. He has been a member of the board of the directors of the Chilean Anthropological Association and of the Latin American Anthropology Association. His uh, research interests are many, but uh, his most recent book, Contemporary Anthropology, Intersections, Encounters, and Reflections from the South South, tells us a lot about his interest in the anthropology of globalization and the anthropology of disasters. Last but not least, Gustavo Lins Ribeiro, who is now a professor at the Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana in Mexico, Lerma. He's also a professor emeritus of the University of Brasilia. He was a visiting professor in Argentina, Colombia, and many other countries, including the US. His field of research include topics such as development, international migration, globalization, transnationalism, and world anthropologists. And his last book, Otras Globalizaciones, exactly also touches upon exactly this issue of globalization and other anthropologists. He was also a member of the Advisory Council of the Werner Grant Foundation, a past president of the Brazilian Anthropological Association, and of AMPOX, the Brazilian Association of Research and Graduate Programs, and also a founder and first chair of the World Council of Anthropological Associations, as well as a vice president, a past vice president of the International Union of Anthropological and Ethnological Sciences. So having presented all these distinguished speakers, I will start by giving the floor to our easternmost colleague, um, 
Takami, I please ask you to uh, respect the five minutes so that we can have the first round and then a second round followed by open debate. And many of the questions will probably start showing up in the chat. I will also ask the people who write in the chat to please, along with their names, write the country they come from. So we have a wider notion of everyone that participates in this WCA webinar. Thank you very much. Takami? Thank you. And thank you very much for inviting me. Um, let me begin with an old story. My interest in the issue of academic hegemony goes back a long time. From 1982 to 89, I studied anthropology at UCLA. And after that, I taught for four years at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond. I became a permanent resident of the US, but later I decided to return to Japan for various reasons. And soon afterward, I wrote a paper about how much Japanese scholarship was marginalized in the world from the viewpoint seldom discussed at that time, the power difference or inequality in the academic world system. I noticed this as I readapted to Japan. Because I was American trained, I knew very little about Japanese anthropology. If anything, I had an American bias toward non-Western scholarship. However, as I knew more about things Japanese, I realized that the bias was unfounded. I then asked myself why Japanese anthropology was little known internationally. The other side of this question was, why can Americans pass when many of them are ignorant of or do not even care about scholarship in other countries? I found an answer. One of the answers in the work of one Swedish anthropologist, uh, Thomas Gerholm. I think he was Professor Hannes's colleague. Now, Gerholm argued that in our discipline, there is a world system in which the US, the UK, and France occupy the center, while all the other countries have been pushed toward the margin. He then compared center and periphery or margin to mainland and island. As he said, there is a frequent ferry service uh, between them, but it is a, almost always a one-way traffic. The mainland teaches while the small islands study diligently. Between the islands, on the other hand, the, the, the traffic is minimal, so they don't know each other well. You know, this argument inspired me. My thoughts came together in one book titled Native Anthropology with a provocative subtitle, The Japanese Challenge to Western Academic Hegemony. It came out in 2004, the same year uh, WCA was created. Since then, I think we have seen two new developments. Uh, one is neoliberalism and the other is world university rankings. As an economic policy, neoliberalism neoliberal maximizes individual profit by removing obstacles to business efficiency. When applied to scholarship, one such obstacle deficiency is the use of local languages most people don't know. As a result, peripheral scholars have no alternative but to write in English if they wish to be recognized uh, globally. And this is by itself a great disadvantage for no English speakers. But I would say that learning to write in ways that appeal to the central scholars is far more difficult than mere language training. It includes the choice of proper writing styles, you know, suitable subject matters, theories, methods, and so on. It is also very important to cite the works highly valued in the anglophone world, uh, while those valued elsewhere are easily overlooked. And despite all of this, I'm rather optimistic because the development of artificial intelligence in recent years has been just remarkable. Between major languages, at least, the quality of automatic translation has reached an incredibly high level. Of course, the inequality in academic writing I have just mentioned has not been solved. But as ideas from marginal countries become more linguistically accessible, I'm hoping that people will eventually learn 
to appreciate uh, their intellectual traditions as well as um, styles of argument. As for world university rankings, uh, top 15 universities on the latest list of the Times Higher Education are either British or American with one exception. The three major criteria used by the Times Higher Education are research, teaching, and this is important, citation. To be cited, especially in top class indexed journals, we must actually write in English in the accepted styles and this will further uh, strengthen Anglo-American hegemony. But I think we are seeing here another new trend, and this is my last word. China is rapidly catching up. Indeed, Peking University and Tsinghua University in Beijing are ranked 17th in the same slot, while my country, Japan, is declining. Um, like everything else, China may turn out to be a big game changer. Um, I will stop here for now. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Takami. Uh, we will now uh, hear, listen, um, James Gang Chen, please. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Yeah, I will begin by a little bit introduction about uh, Chinese anthropology, about its tradition. Anthropology was introduced into China I think last century, about 1920 or 1950, uh, anyway, that almost that time from, not only from Europe first. Uh, uh, then, you know, there are quite three sources, anthropology came to China, a lot of books translated into Chinese, I mean, anthropology books. That's one source. Secondary, a lot of, uh, I, I, I can say a lot, some Chinese, scholars trained either in Europe, basically Britain, or USA returned to China to teach. The last one, some, like uh, some famous anthropologist came to China to teach, like uh, Red Kip Brown. Anyway, this is the first impact, first anthropology came to China. Then there is another, another, another one that's 1949 after, you know, New China, that's a new China was founded. Then China got a big impact from, you know, Soviet Union or, or Russia, and a big impact. So ethnology, then ethnology, or you say Soviet style ethnology became kind of important in China. Anthropology or Western style anthropology was kicked out, uh, kicked out from the universities as a discipline. So this is from 1950s all the way to, to 1980s. So in 1980s, China opened up again. So you can, you can imagine a lot of anthropologists came to China to do field work. So that's 1980s. Their books about China were published in the late 19, 1980s and early 1990s such as like uh, Sumi Huang's book, Spiral Road, and a lot of, you know, Helen Xu, a lot of anthropologists. So these books, big impact in China. So this is, we still talk about, this is West impacts. So this is 1980s, 1990s and early 1920s, a lot of Chinese scholars returned from, either from Europe or from, a lot of them returned from USA. So, and they took up some teaching positions in major universities in China. Mentioned, uh, Takumi mentioned about Peking University, Tsinghua University, those major universities in China have, you know, professors returning from, from the board. So this is, a, this is a period of time. You can see this West impact. And uh, I think some of you, I don't know whether any of you have attended the two, 2009, uh, that that's conference in Kunming. That's uh, IUAES. That's that's per big big one for 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 Chinese anthropologist. One of the big event. Anyway, that's kind of a kind of a showcase to see how anthropology developed in China. So this is about anthropology. Meanwhile, from fifties all the way to, to today, ethnology had its own unique development supported by the government. So basically this is about this case. So 
ever since when I returned, ever since I returned to China, I returned to China in 2007. I heard, often heard about, uh, you know, in Chinese anthropology, you know, well, to talk about localized, they use the word localized anthropology, especially a lot of uh, ethnologists. The, the, we you know, they often confront, confront you, know, you know, like people like me who returned to China or trained in, in either in the USA or in, in, in Britain. Anyway, we often talk about, we often, kind of argue. Anyway, they talk about oh, localized Chinese anthropology, uh, localized ethnology or anthropology. So this is kind of situation, but this is how Chinese anthropology development. So a lot of a lot of us try to, a lot of us, especially a lot of uh, today well-established ones had their roots in, in, in the West. And also a lot of well-established ethnologists Maybe they, they, they don't even speak English, so this is the case. But in Chinese case, you know, they, talk, they often emphasize the local, local, localized anthropology. One of the one of the one of them emphasizes the rich history, especially the written history of China, <laughs> as, as, as something, you know, as a way, you know, for Chinese anthropology to develop. This is the case too. I just last week, last weekend, I, re I just returned from a. From a conference, it's it is it is organized by Advanced Forum of Anthropology in China. This forum was is was established twenty years ago, so it's just celebrated 20, 20 birthday. So one of the job for this forum is, you know, just to combine these two, lo local local locally trained anthropologists, anthropologists trained in the West. So this is the case for me. Uh, I myself, you know, as Sarah mentioned about, uh, Clara mentioned about, um, chief editor of an English journal. <laughs> one of the one of the goal when I take this position at at editor for that journal is try to, you know, introduce to to the West, especially to English speaking countries, newly developed or new development in Chinese in Chinese anthropology. So basically, for me, it's just like like this. In Chinese case, there are two thoughts going on. It's, Thank you. It's, it's I think a that's and there's guidance. All right. Thank Where? you very much, um, James. There's someone there that has a, a microphone on and has a family background. So please mute your micros unless you yeah. are yeah. talking. Yeah. I'm done. Okay. So the next one, uh, the next speaker will be Hulf Feinertz. Hulf, please, and thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see if this works. Uh, you hear me. Okay, so there is now one dominant world language since the mid 20th century or so. And I think we should be glad that there is such a language, even if it's to the advantage of those who also have that as a national language. It's uh, the language uh, which allows all of us, wherever we are, to be in touch. We would hardly want to abolish the presence of a world language. I cannot see that we would now want to exchange it for some other existing language. Uh, I think it would be impractical to try to invent some new shared language, some kind of Esperanto. And maybe I'm old fashioned, but I don't think we could rely on instant digital translation anytime soon. The response obviously should not be to stop attending to US anthropology either. The USA is a very large and still quite affluent country. And so it has many strong universities producing a considerable part of world anthropology. I'm inclined nowadays, however, to be a spectator from some distance when American anthropologists engage in their own debates, generational or otherwise. And we should not necessarily take for granted that their battles are also ours. For one thing, not all anthropologists need to be decolonized and some have already been through that. So I think we all need to be effectively at least bilingual 
with English in any combination. If we still want to use a national language in written scholarly communication, be it German, Japanese or Portuguese, we should make sure also to do some such academic writing in English or to have it translated into English for the benefit of colleagues elsewhere. But we must not make the discipline monolingual in English. We should do some writing in the language or whatever are our compatriots as public anthropology to participate in national public culture and to show taxpayers what they get for their money. Thank you. Thank you very much, Huth. Uh, so now we will go to our next speaker, Shannon Moreira from uh, South Africa. Thank you for Thanks your so much. Um, so I'm going to approach this um, from the angle of, of knowledge production um, and a little bit from ideas of curriculum and teaching. So how we pass that knowledge on across the generations in anthropology. And I think thinking from these angles as thinking from the other angles in which other speakers have mentioned, the answer to that first question, is there hegemony in the profession of anthropology, is, is a very clear yes, but it's also something of, of a complicated yes. So the idea of hegemony is obviously concerned with the ways in which um, those with power, a position of dominance, control not only institutions, but also um, intellectual norms. Um, so that that dominant viewpoint becomes universalized, becomes seen as natural. And I think in much of academia, this is very easy for all of us to see, particularly if you live and work in a post-colonial space. So the systems of education, pedagogy, institutions, language, uh, peer review, publishing, everything in the academy, largely, certainly here, uh, comes from a colonial history of British imperialism within South Africa, and then in terms of, of the South African Academy, also of American imperialism after, after World War II. So I was going to be putting a lovely image in the chat here, um, which I can't do now that I had to switch devices because of my sound, uh, but essentially the top 20 ranked uh, index journals in African studies right now, 14 out of 20 of those emanate um, from the, the Global North. Another two come from the Global North and Africa, and only four come from Africa itself in African studies. So this is right now, this is after the so-called decolonial turn, it's after decades of activist academic work on the geopolitics of knowledge production. So we definitely see historical power at play um, in terms of who produces knowledge about whom and from where. I think that that is our starting point. But it's also, a bit complicated. Um, there's no doubt that the cultures of teaching anthropology, of doing anthropology in different sites, exist within the same sort of power-laden complex system as do other disciplines within the social sciences. But I think there's something slightly different about anthropology as a discipline, in my opinion. And we can look at this if we think about the South African student protests as an, as an example. And as an example um, through which to think about Southern African anthropology and the work that has been done here. So the protests we saw in South Africa from 2015 were partly about knowledge production and partly about its effects on teaching. They were also about a lot of other things, but let's just sort of think about those here. So Gustavo who's gonna to speak just now to us has worked with the idea of provincial cosmopolitanism to reflect the fact that many academics outside of the center need to have extensive knowledge across theoretical universes. So to be able to speak to the local and the international. But student protests in South Africa about curricula in particular, were actually criticizing those spaces where provincial cosmopolitanism wasn't present. The spaces which taught the same curricula, at least in the opinion of students, as we've been taught in, in the global north. So the spaces within the periphery, which were nonetheless engaged in provincialism, only teaching work from the center. So I'm in a very lucky position in a way, um, due to the role I have within my institution. So I'm an anthropologist, um, but I don't, um, I'm not based in an anthropology department, which means I work across the disciplines a lot of the time. And it means I get to see a lot of uh, what's similar across the social sciences and what it is that's different. And one of the things I think that's different about anthropology and that really matters to a conversation about hegemony is that anthropologists have always been interested in pluriversality on a theoretical level and have always seen theoretical and ontological value 
in indigenous concepts or local concepts, endogenous concepts, whatever we want to call it. So our theory is often drawn from those spaces, even if it's then recirculated in these sort of different power laden global spaces. And in the South African context, to get back there, which is which is where I'm going to finish off, this meant that anthropology curricula in terms of the student protests, unlike, for example, some of the philosophy curricula, some of the political science curricula were already cosmopolitan and centrally already had a really strong theoretical universe based in Southern African cosmologies. So I remember um, during the protests having a particular uh, professor within my institution say, but the students want us to have local theory, there is no local theory. And I think in the case of anthropology, that is definitely not, not true. So it doesn't mean that there aren't power problems within Southern African anthropology, but it does mean that unlike in other disciplines, in anthropology in general, I think we don't have to start thinking about hegemony from the point of view of a limited theoretical universe that we're trying to expand. We can instead start from a starting point of knowing that we have very rich and very multiple theoretical universes, but that they don't always speak to one another. So the question really is, how do we work with expanding the reach of local conceptual theorizing so it isn't confined to the peripheries? So there's space here for the hegemonic and the non-hegemonic anthropologies to meet. And I think I'm gonna leave it there, thanks. Okay, Shannon, thank you very much. So we'll now move to Latin America. So we will have Gonzalo Diaz Croveto from Chile. Gonzalo, where are you? Thank you, Clara. You? Okay. I'm very glad to be here and I'm very grateful for the invitation. For my first five minutes, I have some reflection and proposal to share. Uh, the center of my arguments will deal with the question of the hegemony of value and the ways this affects our discipline. I'm especially interested in problematizing the ways in which value is assigned outside the margins of our discipline. Therefore, to ask about the hegemony of value it has epistemic, theoretical, and political implications. We have to consider anthropology as possibilities which therefore allow us to propose other alternative value scales to those that the market can offer us. For that, we have to think and act in cosmopolitical terms. A special place to see hegemony in value in our current times is to recognize that a great part of the policy about value is made outside of our anthropological community. Therefore, without our more or less shared moral values. I'm talking about the hegemony of a university world system, where the worldwide difference is made by the transnational capitalists of gathering information firms. There are too many aspects to contest and also to recognize about what anthropologists do inside and outside university. Many practices are not considered by the transnational firms and also by the National Council of Research and Science. That's a problem for the recognition of value and the making of difference between anthropologists and anthropologists around the world. The funny thing is that we have different and notable theoretical frame to recognize and think about these topics. Uh, for example, we have the concept about audit culture from Marilyn Strater. Uh, we have the discussion about public policy from Chris Shaw and Susan Wright. We have the bullshit jobs and total bureaucracy from David Graeber. We also have the discussion about cosmopolitics by Gustavo Lins Ribeiro, and we have all the work published by the World Anthropologist Network. For this scenario, I have two proposals, not solution, only proposals. On one hand, we may consider creating a World Anthropological Value Index. The index could have global arrangement, but always refine it and expand it locally, at least in national context. This index could give value in all what anthropologists do inside and outside the university. Over time, this global index could counteract the value given by the knowledge market and propose alternatives that could impact the national ways of assigning value to what anthropologists really do. If we do this, we will be able to give value to different types of tasks that anthropologists perform. For example, those related to dissemination and application of knowledge to social intervention, to technical reports, to training and teaching tasks, aspects that usually remain outside the bibliometric index and outside the parameters of the, of the science council. In this way, 
we call contest the value that resides in all kinds of action and interaction of performance of anthropologies in different historical, geographical, and social contexts in the world, yet not by arrangement given by the global market. On the other hand, another possibility to act global is to write more for an audience outside the academic discipline, to give more and more space for what anthropologists do outside the university, and also to commit to making a more accessible anthropology for non-anthropologists. For this, we have to regenerate new anthropological magazine of global reach, translated into several languages, so we can cross the discipline and give space for anthropologists that earn their life doing anthropology outside the academy. I really believe, as Gustavo Lins Rivera once pointed out, that anthropology must maintain its subversive spirit. Thank you. Gonzalo, thank you very much. And now, last but not least, Gustavo Lins Ribeiro, uh, I'll give you the floor from Mexico. Thank you so much, Clara. I want to, to thank uh, the WCAA uh, colleagues for inviting me to be here uh, this morning, afternoon, night. <laughs> and um, I want to say hi to all my friends. Uh, in different places uh, of the world. Oh, this is such a, a huge, uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, uh, issue. I just want to, to make some general uh, statements. Um, well, uh, if, if we think about hegemony in Gramscian terms, uh, we will have to admit uh, that hegemony is part of, uh, uh, of social life, uh, it, it's impossible uh, not to have uh, hegemony. So the problem is what we do with hegemony. Uh, as, uh, as we know, hegemony means accepting uh, domination in, in, in uh, having a consensus uh, that that kind of, uh, of structuring relationships uh, is, is fine. Uh, and, and most of the time it, it works in, in silent ways. And then uh, I think that one step ahead uh, of dealing with hegemony is, is, is making noise about it, is, is talking about it. And, and we have been doing this for, for quite a, a while here. Uh, at least, uh, I mean, there are so many works that, that were written uh, decades uh, ago, uh, and just to name uh, a few that I think are fundamental, it's the Ethnos uh, volume that Upanets and Thomas Gerholm that uh, Takami already mentioned, edited in 1982, or when they when they called, they used the the metaphor of the uh, world system of anthropological production uh, to. To, to call the attention about uh, the, the, the different power, different epistemic communities had uh, to, to, to uh, uh, share uh, their works uh, on, on a global level. So, but it, if I'm right that hegemony is everywhere, uh, it's not only a global issue, it's also a regional, I mean, uh, that has to do with with uh, the way the, 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 the world's organized, like in Europe, what kind of hegemony you have, what kind of uh, relationships you have uh, among different uh, uh, anthropological communities or in Latin America, or even uh, on the national level, like, you know, uh, in big communities like uh, the Brazilian one, the Mexican one, there's also a hegemonic game that is being played and even as we know, on local levels, uh, uh, as uh, we see some departments are more powerful than, than others and so on. So, uh, I mean, uh, it's, 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 it's an issue that uh, we have always to pay attention uh, to on different global uh, levels of, of, of action. But of course, it's always more difficult when we're talking about uh, the, the, the global level, or if you wish, the, uh, about uh, transnational politics. The WCAA was something that came uh, to, to deal with these kind of issues on a global transnational level. 
and it's being uh, doing a, a, a very uh, positive work for almost now uh, 20 years in 2024, the WCAA is going to be uh, 20 years old. Uh, but uh, it, uh, how much of the uh, the powerful global structures uh, of power that are based on uh, on very hard structures or like you know the economic and political power of, of one country uh, on the global scene? How much of this uh, can we change? Uh, of course, as anthropologists, we are always thinking about diversity, plurality, and and we 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 um, uh, we, we how, what's the best verb here? Uh, we enjoy and 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 love uh, diversity and plurality, and uh, but this is not all, always uh, the case when we we come to see how the hard structures, hard structures of hegemony operate uh, on, on uh, the global level. And, and that has to do Sorry, there was some kind of uh, echo. Uh, and so uh, that has to do with the structures of imperialism, that, that uh, are around us and that are changing. And, and again, uh, the world is changing. Uh, we are going to, to witness uh, uh, perhaps not uh, some of us that are here, but the, 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 in the next uh, 30 years, and I think this is going to be the case, uh, the, uh, a new kind of hegemony within the world system, and this will affect also the scientific and academic world. And this has to do with the coming of China to the to the uh, center uh, of the, the the world system. Uh, uh, this is already uh, been mentioned. It, it, it China is, is already uh, uh, the largest uh, producer uh, of science in the world, publishing in English more than, than anyone else. Uh, I, I don't know how is that uh, in, in Mandarin or in other languages that are spoken in, in China, but I, I don't see, uh, uh, as far as I can see, that this will be automatically uh, the case in, in anthropology for different reasons and a main one is language. Uh, I know that uh, there is a great effort uh, in, in China to, to, to go uh, global also in, 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 um, in anthropology, uh, but uh, so far it's hard to see uh, whether this will happen with the same speed as it has happened in disciplines uh, such as biology, physics, mathematics, uh, chemistry, and so forth, which share uh, other kind of languages that uh, don't, don't have to do necessarily with uh, having uh, a global uh, common language as uh, we need to have in the humanities. And, and the social sciences. So what uh, I'm worried about is how will uh, transnational anthropological politics be in the near future? And more than that, uh, how will anthropology itself be in different uh, areas uh, of, of the world? I think this is a, a main issue uh, or how we want to be recognized, uh, how we will interfere in, in, in public political uh, life and in the several utopian uh, struggles that are, are, are being fought uh, at this uh, very moment and that uh, we, we as anthropologists have much to say and uh, we haven't uh, interfered in, in this uh, discourse, global discourse area, so to speak, uh, so far with the intensity we could do. Uh, and this uh, has also to do with uh, the 
and hegemony, uh, with hegemony and anthropology, but mostly now related to the to other disciplines' capacity of uh, creating global interpretations. Uh, I, I will uh, stop here and looking forward uh, to the conversation. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Gustavo. So now that we had the first round of um, participation, uh, we've had some different opinions. And as we, I think we all acknowledge, this is a very wide and manifolded topic. And this is exactly why uh, Gordon's idea of creating a task force on this, I think is so important because actually there are so many multiple aspects that it's quite, it's quite complicated to address them all in this uh, one and a half hour uh, webinar. But still, uh, as you can see in the chat, uh, comments and questions to our speakers and a lot of comments and what they have said uh, came up and are coming up still. And uh, I think there's basically two, two positions here that have been addressed in the, in the, um, in the brief um, talks by the participants. First of all, the question of language, of course, which is a major topic on this, in this hegemony um, issue, which is, uh, is it good to have a common language to communicate and to publicate so that we can all understand each other? Some of us think yes, some of us think no. On the other hand, uh, is it so that we should not encourage the national languages uh, to be used? And the second, of course, I think the, the other second main issue, which is a huge issue, is as Gonzalo and Shannon explained, the value uh, of anthropology in different, in different countries and how we do um, use our skills very much uh, formatted by hegemonic um, models, which are, as many said, mainly US and British uh, standards. And, uh, and of course, um, what happens then to other anthropologists, of course, Gustavo just touched upon that and it's, uh, it's for the future to see and for the upcoming generations of anthropologists, but still, I think there's a lot of issues here that have been discussed uh, on, on the chat and that we can go back to now that I will ask our speakers to do the second round, then we can go again uh, back to chat and to specific questions. So I will um, start in the same order again with Takami, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think I want to begin by responding to Gordon Matthews' request or question. Practically speaking, how can we overcome the issue of hegemony of anthropology? Um, maybe one way to overcome the issue is to include the works of marginal scholars in the reading, basic reading lists of our syllabuses. I'm not saying that these works deserve attention just because they have been neglected or they have been treated unfairly. Uh, rather, my point is that um, there seems to be a pattern of neglect in which English language books are assigned in the classroom, even if they're not particularly good, while um, truly good ones uh, coming from the periphery are habitually neglected. And to some extent, this is unavoidable because of the language barrier. But if the pattern of neglect persists uh, because of the prejudice against uh, peripheral scholarship, then we must change it. Um, so my proposal is to ask uh, member nations of WCA to create a basic reading list first and then do the actual work of with the machine, I mean, artificial intelligence, if possible, to let it do the actual work of translation. So that's my first comment. And my second comment has to do with uh, Gustavo's um, remark that even though China has appeared as a great power, it doesn't necessarily mean that China will be hegemonic in anthropology. I agree, but I think there is uh, one thing we should be careful about is the huge size of um, Chinese community of scholars and students. And the sheer size of the scale often gives rise to a great deal of power and influence. And let me give you my own example. Um, the Japanese edition of my book, 
Native anthropology was recently translated into Chinese. And they made as many as 4,000 copies, which really surprised me. The original English uh, edition was only made 1,500 copies. And I'm not sure how the book is doing in China. Uh, this past October, a very detailed review uh, came out in Chinese, and then I had artificial intelligence translation, uh, which I could understand about 70%. Uh, may I continue? Um, so now that China has appeared as a great power, I'm just curious. Uh, what kind of paths my own book will follow through the Chinese translation? And my last comment has to do with um, citation practices. According to the statistics about five years ago, uh, two thirds of the indexed journals, I mean indexed are in the social science citation index are either American or British. And to get published in these journals, we must essentially follow the Anglo-American model of scholarship. And the pressure is particularly high in countries where promotion uh, is based on whether they have published in such journals. Um, regarding East Asia, uh, within East Asia, there are quite a few differences about this matter. Uh, they say Taiwan and Hong Kong are plagued with so-called SSCI syndrome, whereas Japan is almost totally immune because Japan's uh, domestic publishing market is big enough to be self-sufficient. So there are different degrees of uh, exposure to academic colonialism, but there is just the opposite side to it. Uh, because Japanese scholars can write in their own language and in their own styles, they end up being little known outside Japan, whereas just the opposite is true of Taiwan and Hong Kong. I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Takami. Uh, we will go on with uh, James Chen, please. Yeah, I will continue from Takami is mean about China and about Chinese case. I think in Chinese case, Chinese try to develop in two ways. I, I told you before about localization of anthropology in China. That's a lot of Chinese made efforts in that. For those people, you know, they, they don't believe, uh, you talk about West hegemony. Uh, well, it's it, for them, you know, a lot of Chinese believe anthropology is the West discipline. It's from the West. It's like a Marxism from the West. Now they talk about Chinese, 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 Chinese style Marxism. <laughs> right now, we will, probably in the future, we will talk about Chinese style anthropology. But anyway, this is for the, this is just a lot of Chinese. They believe anthropology is from the West, and they use it and try to develop it and try to develop their own methods or theories in anthropology. Okay, and, and I don't think Chinese anthropologists have some problems in published in English. Okay, even though a lot of them publish in Chinese, I think a lot of well-established scholars never published papers in English. But, but, but a lot of, most of Chinese anthropology, I think kind of open-minded. So you, 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 you say for the, you know, the, they, they do their work, to do their field work in China, they try to, you know, localize West concept. They try to develop new theories or new approaches. But uh, also, they are not uh, afraid of, you know, when you published their findings in English. This is what this is my experience when, I, when we set up this journal. We try to. You know, try to encourage a lot of Chinese, especially well established professors, to publish their theory or their discoveries, their findings in our journal in English. This is also the case in Chinese education systems. A lot of PhD or MA students, when they are writing their thesis, there is always a literature review. In the literature review, you have to do both cases one in China. So, uh, so researches by Chinese scholars in China that are published in Chinese. Then another, uh, you know, re review, literature review 
this Western language, not, not probably not just English, German, or French, also included, but most cases in English sources. So as I say, and also a lot of Chinese, and I'm, I'm sure in the near, in the future, near future, some Chinese universities, you will see more English journals pop up, show up. This is this is the case for the Chinese anthropologists to let the West to see their, you know, their how their localized anthropology to their their findings. So. No, no, you know, in Chinese, I, I don't expect other people will read or so read or speak in Chinese, but we do, as I said, do, we do need, it's like science, so, uh, anthropology, social science, it's also science, it's like uh, other science, you, you need the language that everybody, not most people can share, can see, you can discuss, can discuss. So this is my point. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, James. We will move on to Ulf Anets. Ulf? Okay, just a moment and I'll be with you with some prepared comments here. There we go. Uh, Gustavo actually mentioned an article and uh, an journalist you that my late colleague Thomas Jerholm and I edited actually 40 years ago on the shaping of national anthropologists and I just had a look back at that uh, introductory uh, essay there that Thomas Jerholm and I did and unfortunately that's not electronically available but I'm going to do something about that so uh, if uh, any of you are interested uh, let me know by email and uh, I'll try to get it to you uh, relatively soon. Okay, now to uh, my next set of comments. Uh, uh, so, there are now anthropologists in just about every country in the world, and they should all have a good chance to participate and be listened to in the exchanges in the global anthropological community. But my sense is that so far, if you have not at one time or other been part of the local scene in American or British anthropology, as either students or teachers, your voice is less likely to be heard. Mm -hmm. The Frenchman Claude Lévi-Strauss, the Indian Emmons Srinivas, or the Norwegian Frederick Bart should serve as examples of such successful travelers. So perhaps we should try to turn the tables. Young prospective anthropologists in those Anglophone centers of the discipline should be told that people in other countries are not just natives to be studied or possibly somewhere a globally, but probably temporarily fashionable philosopher. Again, there are now local anthropologists everywhere. So graduate students going out for field research should be advised to meet colleagues in the field country to get their views of one's own field project, and also to find out what they are doing in themselves. Stronger graduate departments should offer courses on world anthropology, not just courses on what American anthropologists are doing in different regions, but what the local colleagues are up to. The graduate departments in American universities could even, could even advise their students to spend one year of their graduate education at the university somewhere else in the world, where they would get a sense of what local anthropologists are doing and of the general intellectual climate there and of what America looks like from abroad. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ulf. Uh, so now, um, Shannon, please. It's your turn again. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so I, I think what I'd like to speak to here, um, similarly to people who've come before me, is, is what can we do to work against the issues that we've raised so far? And I want to just talk about two strategies. So first, I said last time that something that I think anthropology does well compared to other social sciences is recognizing endogenous concepts as valid categories for analysis. But we still very much have a situation where they're seen as only local. 
as only sort of ethnographic examples that work within the context that's being presented in a particular study. So theoretical concepts and categories of analysis um, that emerge from a Euro-Anglo history of thought, on the other hand, are assumed to be universal and assumed to be applicable everywhere. And we really don't tend to do this the other way around. But in anthropology, I think we are in a position to do this the other way around. So one of the things that I think we need to do is to find ways to take, um, yeah, to take endogenous cosmologies far more seriously within our practices of knowledge production. So to start to see the concepts that come out of wherever it is we're working in the world as sites for much more widely applicable theorizing than just in that particular social context. So an example um, in a recent paper, a colleague, uh, Tamuka Chekero and myself worked with the, um, the Shishona concept of Hushamari to try to make sense of migration uh, of Zimbabweans to South Africa. And working with that concept really allowed us to do a very different kind of work. So the notion of Hushamari is, is a, a local way of making strangers into something like kin. So something that I think is quite familiar in, in a lot of, of social contexts that anthropologists have worked. But mobilizing it as a theoretical concept rather than presenting it um, as, as a finding really allowed us uh, in the work we did to move away with some of the binaries that you often see in the social science of migration, particularly in South Africa. So binaries between locals and foreigners, legal, illegal, et cetera. Hushamwari using a local concept led us to a very different kind of theoretical work. And obviously we got there from working from the ground up. Um, so from working with kind of local, local concepts. And that's not unusual in anthropology, but it is unusual to take it out of the realm of those individual contexts and think about how it can be applied more widely. So I think that's one strategy for, um, yeah, for, for, for moving a little away from hegemony. The second thing that I wanna just very briefly touch on, which has come up a bit uh, in the conversation so far, is who it is that we draw on in our thinking and our writing. So I think we need to think very carefully about our processes of publication. So if we wanted, for example, to expand our citational universes, I think we really have to put systematic interventions in place to make sure it happens. Um, so as, as Clara so kindly said in her introduction, I've been an editor on two different journals. Um, and from that, um, and I'm sure many of you have been in similar positions, you know that there's a huge amount of power, just for example, in reviewer guidelines, in the things that we tell reviewers to look out for. If it became sort of standard practice to ask reviewers to point out to authors the geopolitical gaps in their citation practices, who they're talking about, who they're using, then things would begin to shift. It would be a thing that, that people would look at. Um, so one of the things that really annoys, annoys me as an examiner or a reviewer um, or as an editor is, is exactly as, as was just said, when a writer writes all about a local place, but doesn't draw on any local theorists um, in, in doing that work. And, and we're in a position um, in our publication practices to, yeah, to point those things out and to shift what's seen as legitimate, to shift what is, what is valued. Because I think a key point, uh, just to wrap up, a key point in all of this is that hegemony is systematic. It's often invisible, particularly to those who are wielding the soft power. So if we can find systematic ways to surface it and make those forms of power obvious, then we might be, yeah, might be able to to make some changes. Thanks. All right, thank you very much, Shannon. Now we are again moving from South Africa, from the African continent to South America, and we'll have Gonzalo again, Chile, please. Thank you, Clara. I want to reaffirm some issues and put some news. Uh, let me put it simple. Is it a published paper in a global index more relevant for the discipline than a social intervention done by an anthropologist anywhere? So again, the question is, who should assign value? Who should assign the value for the knowledge for our discipline? I'm talking again in a cosmopolitical uh, way. Um, also, uh, it's applied anthropology only re relevant for local and regional anthropology? or we can also everyone learn from this kind of anthropology. Yeah. Uh, I think that it's really, really important to make this discussion about contesting global transnational market as segment of value. And, and I really think that WCA could do it. Yeah. Uh, 
And another thing that I want to, to point it out is um, could be an imperative point to build more bridges with social and global or other local context problems in a non-academic language. Could that be an imperative for us as being here in a WCA to build more uh, bridges uh, with all the problems that we are now having in, in, in different kinds of regions. But to do build these bridges, uh, we need to start to write in different kinds. And that is really important. We, uh, and that is not new for the discipline. We haven't done before. Yeah. We really have done it before in the 40s and the 30s. And I think we can we can do the same things at the at the same time, but at this point we it can't put it away. We have to do it. It's imperative, at least for for my argument. So thank you, Clara. Okay, Gonzalo. Thank you very much, Gustavo. Again. Thank you. Uh, yes, Virginia, you're right. Uh, a lot of people don't know about uh, the WCAA in the US, but uh, many people do, and uh, not that, that many, but uh, several of them. And uh, uh, I'm not surprised by that. I mean, the, that's what we, we call the uh, metropolitan provincialism. Uh, you know, the empire center can indulge in, uh, in, in not acknowledging the existence of others outside of its own uh, borders. Uh, so it, it's the, the same old problem. Uh, yes, uh, since, uh, there's a comment from the Facebook, from Facebook about interdisciplinary power. Uh, most of the time we don't pay enough attention to that. And when it comes to, to the structures of financing uh, research, uh, especially on the uh, equivalent uh, of our National Science Foundations, the way the, 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 the funds are distributed, uh, usually uh, uh, is uh, something that uh, really uh, look at uh, anthropology and the humanities and other social sciences disciplines are something that, uh, that they don't really need uh, a lot of money. And when they do the political climate changes, uh, uh, either they want to, 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 to make a big pack package of anthropology with history, sociology, literature, whatever. Uh, and, and then uh, what does that mean? That there is also a struggle to 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 uh, be fought within our national scientific systems. It's not always global. It's it, it has a lot to do with what's going on with our universities and with the national science foundations of our countries. So I think we 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 should never forget about this. I, I love the, this discussion because it's showing how the low side of enunciation is important. Uh, when we move from the, the, the east to the west, uh, uh, China kind of disappears. <laughs> but uh, uh, if, if we close to, to China, it, it, it becomes uh, 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 a big issue. And uh, yes, uh, language is not everything, but if you're a native of English, it helps. And I, I think that as South Africa is a, a good example of that uh, because uh, um, I, I guess that not, not all, uh, there are some exceptions because of the Afrikaners in, in, in South Africa, but uh, many, if not all of uh, our South African colleagues uh, write in, in English. And that means that you immediately writing in the international uh, language of scientific uh, communication. And, and that also, and this gets reflected uh, very easily as we can see in the history of anthropology, many of the most famous uh, anthropologists in the world are South Africans and we don't even uh, pay attention to that. Uh, just to mention a few, uh, living ones, uh, Adam Cooper and the Comoros, uh, for instance, 
uh, they, they, they're not Americans uh, and, and or neither are they uh, British, they, they South Africans. Um, I guess that, uh, well, there's a lot to talk about uh, the issue that uh, uh, Uf, uh said about uh, how uh, foreign anthropologists uh, kind of uh, do not take into consideration what the local ones are doing. Uh, the uh, Brazilian Association of Anthropologists uh, 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 wrote uh, and approved uh, a motion against what we, we, we are calling cognitive extractivism. And that is uh, something that is really serious. It has to do with the decolonization of uh, anthropology and other major issues of unequal relationships between uh, different anthropological uh, communities. Uh, the, well, uh, of course, I don't think uh, that um, because Leah was also, Leah Ferrero was commenting on this. I don't think uh, uh, anthropology is irrelevant. I, I, I think it's very relevant. Otherwise, <laughs> why would I dedicate uh, so much of my life uh, to doing it? Uh, but the problem, the problem is showing how relevant it is, and that uh, that uh, changes a lot according to different national scenarios. I think, like in the Brazilian uh, case, we we uh, Brazilian anthropologists have shown we are very relevant, so much relevant that uh, very powerful uh, governmental uh, forces are against us and come after us. So that, that's a proof of how important uh, anthropology is in Brazil, uh, for instance. Uh, thank you. All right, Gustavo, thank you very much. Yeah, I was exactly going to mention the motion uh, made by ABBA, by the Brazilian Anthropological Association, concerning the, the lack of dialogue and respect for local anthropologists. And I think that was a very good move from the from the Brazilian Association. But once again, see, I, I'm thinking of different scales. Uh, the Brazilian Association is a huge association. Brazil is a huge country. There's many anthropologists. Think, for instance, of Portugal. In my case, we are like 300. Uh, we we don't have the same weight. Uh, actually, we trust we we. We lean a lot on Brazilian anthropology, as you know, Gustavo, to make a lot of things because we speak the same language, and it it and there is a a big a big um, uh, relation between Portuguese and Brazilian anthropology. And yes. the fact is yes. that yes. smaller yes. countries, smaller countries with less uh, power and less anthropologists, um, are in a more difficult situation to make such things come out and, and, and be discussed. But anyway, I was also thinking this, besides this, this uh, point of the dialogue, yes? Can I say something on that? Sh sure, okay. may I just finish the sentence and then I'll oh, give sure, you one? Because I was thinking about you know, this, this local anthropology problem, but I was also thinking relating to that, and perhaps you can comment on that together, on what Gonzalo said about anthropologists doing things beyond academics and, and, and for outside the academic community. And the fact is, I totally agree with Gonzalo, but the fact is that once you apply for a position anywhere in the world, there it doesn't matter if it's the US, Portugal, or wherever, if you have in your curriculum, you know, 100 actions on uh, dealing with public, uh, public service or with the civil society, they don't count, they don't count as much, at, or they count perhaps 10%, whereas the fact that you published in highly known journals counts much more. So that's also a problem. And just to finish and pass the word again to Gustavo, WCA has done a lot, uh, thanks to, to, to Gordon also and to Leah and other colleagues on making anthropology known through a variety of languages. The Deja Lu section is exactly that, you know, showing that there's different languages that anthropologists use different languages and that they are important, but still there are other issues we cannot um, touch upon. So Gustavo, please. Well, I'll be very quick. Uh, um, uh, what you were saying is, is very important and we need to, to have this clear, is that size matters. Uh, 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 and, and this is what was also a point that Takami was making about the possible uh, influence of Chinese anthropology in the future. 
it's, China is such a huge country and it's developing so fast its scientific and, and higher education systems that uh, yes, um, this is a, a very uh, possible uh, uh, future uh, uh, scenario. And then uh, we, we'll, we will have to think it as anthropologists, how will we relate? Because of course we, we are used to um, Western hegemony, meaning North Atlantic hege hegemony. Uh, as we know, we, we, we need to understand our Chinese colleagues because they are Chinese. They, they're not Americans, they're not British, they're not French, they're not Germans, uh, and so forth. Uh, uh, so uh, size does matter in, in, in most countries. Uh, let's, let's face it, uh, anthropologists are a small community. Uh, most associations are very small organizations. And uh, uh, so, you know, uh, once uh, we, 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 we get this huge Chinese anthropological community, uh, it will make a, a difference in, in, in the kind of conversations we have on a global level. I think this is for sure. And that's, that's uh, how you also explain it. it of course, size does not explain everything. Uh, uh, the influence of the U.S. anthropology in the world. But when you look at the British anthropology, British anthropology is not that big, uh, right? Uh, how many, I look at the, the, the uh, uh, how is the, the ASA, the uh, association uh, in, uh, of the UK, it, it, it's, it's, it's not uh, very big. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Size does matter. It doesn't explain everything, but it it, it does create a different uh, you know uh, uh, trend and and, and sy synergy. Yes, definitely. Well, what, there's been so many comments and questions on the chat. Um, it's kind of hard to keep up, but I, I would just now you know open the floor to even if people want to talk besides the chat, you can ask. Uh, to talk, but I, I was thinking, I was thinking again, trying to organize our thoughts because so many things came up. Okay, we have the issue of the language, and we have the issue of each country and the proportional value or importance uh, in anthropology each country. We have the other issue that Gonzalo mentioned, which is what do anthropologists do when they do things outside academics, and and then we have a fourth issue, which is. Um, our academic careers and and and, and going in the fact that our academic careers are valued if we do publish in those top journals i think this is all connected it's it's all connected it's all part of this hegemony problem that's why we need to uh, really make this uh, task force go on and, and work on all this. But if you think, for instance, uh, the fact that uh, somewhere in the chat, someone was saying, well, okay, we, we do have to get out of our academic shell, but okay, all disciplines have to do it, of course. But as anthropologists, I think we have a higher duty to do it than other disciplines do because anthropology is really supposed to connect people, right? So. I think in anthropology, it is much more our duty to come out of our academic shell and co communicate with the civil society. And that can only be done also if we go beyond this very academic, hegemonic thinking, in my opinion. But let's hear everyone. Does anyone want to speak? I'm, I'm, I can go back to all the chat, but there's <laughs> dozens of questions here. Um, we have, of course, uh, we had some questions for, for James. Sorry, who's speaking? Muxi's hand, it's for James. Muxi's hand. Okay. Muxi, Muxi, Muxi. Um, thanks, uh, Clara, and thanks everybody. I, I want to raise a question which is in the chat about the way in which I've described as the global north, and it's too simple a phrase, appropriates both the personnel and the ideas that come from the global south and effect effectively co-opts them as their own. So that when Shannon talks about Shamwira as a concept and publishes it, it's very likely it'll be picked up 
and used and then made as if it doesn't come from Southern Africa at all. And one sees that over and over again in the US African Studies Association, but also in anthropology. So how do we deal with that? So another issue to add to the list. That's Gordon, a, did you uh, want to talk, Gordon, or was it Gordon or Gustavo first? That, that oh, was me. Very just, briefly, let me speak in here. Um, we, we face a wonderful differentiation between different societies. I mean, the problems that James is facing are fundamentally different from the problems that Shannon is facing or the problems that Gonzalo is facing. So we've got to realize that we're not dealing with a global south and a global north. We're dealing with a multiple uh, array of societies here. And that really complicates matters enormously. Gustavo? No, uh, what, what Malsi just said, Malsi, this is uh, another example of, uh, of how terrible cognitive extractivism can be. Uh, and, and that's the point. Uh, so we also have to, to put this on the table. Right. I'm not, I'm not so sure. I agree with Gordon in a certain way. Yes, each country has its own problems. But there are a few things that have been mentioned here today that kind of cut, cut across um, the countries, I think. Of course, it, probably an exception of the hegemonic ones anyway, like you know the US or... I think the case uh, that James ex exposed to us is, is very interesting because China is, as we all know, becoming such a huge power and also in academics. But still, there are issues that Gordon touched upon in his chat, uh, in the chat. James, I don't know if you saw it, when he says, OK, but, but what happens with Chinese uh, anthropologists that want to who publish in English and cannot be criticized by the Chinese state? How does it work? And, uh, and of course, this is very China specific, but uh, it might also be uh, equivalent in other countries, not in such a strong way, but still. I don't know, James, do you want to comment on that? on that comment by Gordon? Well, it's difficult to make comments on, on that because not many Chinese published in English. That's first of all. So most of as you said, the majority still published in Chinese. Okay. And, uh, and also, I think a lot of, a lot of Chinese, Chinese anthropologists try pretty much like uh, try to focus on issues social issues. You know China, the, the, the globalization process or modern process is so fast, create a lot of issues for the Han, the majority of people, Han Chinese, you mentioned part of Han Chinese, Chinese, especially a lot of social issues for the ethnic groups. Some of those ethnic groups live, used to live in the mountains. Now, you know, this process or this modern move them to the cities. Oh, anyway, so a lot of issues. So when you talk about issues, I think the government accepts it. It's not, uh, it's there, it's not other things. Okay, so it's different stories. All right, James, thank you so much. Now, Chris, Chris Shore has his hand up, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just uh, wonder that there's a bit of a dilemma that you've kind of both illustrated in, in this, um, the question of appropriation and cognitive extractivism, which is this, that, you know, on the one hand, you want mainstream anthropology to take seriously the voices of world anthropologies and other, other places. Um, but when they do, how do we get out of the, the pit of um, when they start taking, you know, using um, theory from the South or, or kind of ideas that have been generated by scholars from elsewhere. Um, how do you get out of the dilemma of, you know, calling that sort of appropriation or, or extractivism? You know, so where's the, the via di mezza? Where's the, the middle meeting point where, you know, the, the recognition and entering into dialogue and conversation, uh, which foregrounds the knowledge that's come out of these places, can then be picked up and, and used by in the mainstream? I mean, I've always thought that, you know, it's very hard to kind of uh, attribute location, origin to ideas, 
you know, these ideas belong to X or Y. So and anyway, it's, a, it's, a, it's an open question. I'd love to know. I don't know what the answer to that one is myself. Right before getting um, reactions to your questions, uh, let's have Virginia Dominguez. Uh, uh, yes, um, a quick question. I just, I, I wanted to go back to <clears throat> what can we do to break any of these forms of hegemony? Uh, Shannon and Ulf made some suggestions and I, I, I guess I wanted them perhaps to elaborate or other people to think about this because we don't just want to analyze it, the situation, we also want to try to do something about it. Okay, uh, thank you, Virginia. The, do, does Shannon or Ulf want to react to this? Ulf, you have to um, activate your sound, please. Right. Uh... Right, thank you. You hear me now? Uh, well, there's one uh, more issue actually, which uh, I wanted to uh, bring into the discussion. And so uh, let me get to some notes I uh, had on that uh, just a second or so. And it should come here uh, about. Uh, about publishing, which uh, we have mentioned in in different ways, but I think there are sort of uh, central things that we haven't really touched uh, so much on. Uh, uh, and that is uh, the question of publication uh, with regard to books. Uh, I think to reach out globally, uh, you have to publish with one of the American or British scholarly presses, uh, mostly university presses. I think that's the situation so far. But then you will probably stand a better chance again if you have some friendly colleague to help with the connection uh, to be considered at all. And if you get that far, you have to make it through the labyrinth of anonymous reviewers, uh, local desk editors, and freelance manuscript editors who want to leave their mark on your manuscript before you see your work uh, in print. Uh, so good luck. Someone should write or edit a book on the multi-site ethnography of publishing and then try to get that published. Thank you. Yes, I, I think your answer is, is very is very straightforward because the fact is, imagine that anyone in any country, let's just imagine one hypothetical country and just quote anthropologists who have worked in that country, he or she will not be published in a US or British academic uh, editor. So, so uh, Shannon, do you want to say something as uh, Virginia and Chris? Um, I can't see Shannon anymore. Did she, did she disappear? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Uh, Shannon? She was having difficulties with the Zoom uh, before. Uh, I don't know if she disappeared, but anyway. Okay, so let's see if she comes back online. Contact her. Okay, let's, let's see if she comes back online. But does anyone else in the room, uh, in the Zoom room, want to react to Chris and Virginia's um, comments? Um, I want to partially respond to Chris Shaw's question. Uh, if I understood him correctly, uh, his question was, where is the meeting point between Western theory and local anthropology? Is that correct, Chris? No, Chris, you have to unmute yourself, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, no, not quite that. It was more the, the point about how do you, um, what is the, the in putting into practice the, the need and the desire to engage with uh, writing scholarship and ideas that have been extracted from, from field sites in such a way that allows them to enter into the mainstream. I mean, uh, 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 Bugsy has put some of the, Mugsy, sorry, has put some comments in the chat about, you know, acknowledging sources and recognizing who you are using and allowing other people to, participate in that conversation. 
I see. Um, what I'm going to say may be off the mark, but um, I would say that our common enemy is cultural nationalism, which comes out from the desire to be intellectually independent. Uh, for example, just because uh, Evans Pritchard was British doesn't mean that his ideas belong to the British alone. Um, his theory uh, is the common property of all the anthropologists throughout the world, I think. But uh, we should also be careful about what kind of anthropologists of his caliber. Um, who was the anthropologist, for example, a Japanese anthropology who had the same caliber of the same caliber as uh, Evans Pritchard? I think we should constantly ask this kind of questions. Otherwise, uh, the inequality uh, among anthropological communities in the world will never be uh, will never be uh, eliminated. I hope I made my point clear. Thank you so much, Takami. Now we have uh, Shandana has her uh, hand up. Shandana Matur. Shandana, please. Um, hi, everyone. So um, I also wanted to respond to uh, you know the discussion that's sort of happening in the chat around Chris's question, and you know a couple of things. First of all, Magzi all along in the chat has been saying, which I think is really valid, that you know we're talking about the sort of the lack of respect, but you know um, what would proper respect look like? What are people really asking for and aiming for? Um, is it you know, uh, it, it basically, who is it directed towards? Is it towards uh, the, the educational establishments in the global south that they should, um, you know, value and esteem the work done by their own scholars? Is it directed towards the global north? I mean, it could be both, you know, it, there's no reason why not. But some of this discussion is getting a little messy. So for example, when uh, Chris said that, what would be a non-extractive way to, to demonstrate respect? Um, and Maxi had some good answers, except that he also threw in something which I'm really sort of wrestling with, which is, you know, very sort of a calibrated form of respect being offered, this idea that, it should be of such a sort that Global South scholars don't feel the need to migrate to the Global North. And that sounds a bit paternalistic to me. And, you know, so I just wanted to say that there's no really easy answer to how to, um, you know, take each other seriously, I guess. And also we have to figure out um, where we want to be taken seriously, and, you know, by whom and, how we can collectively work towards that, because I think Virginia is also right that this is really a matter of trying to operationalize this. So that was me. All right, Chandana, thank you so much. Does anyone want to react to all these last comments? Any of the speakers or anyone else? Uh, I think it's very interesting to have it open to everyone in the room and that people can speak up. And as I said, you know, the, the, the issue is so large that the, the topic is so manifold that it's very difficult to keep track of all the nuances. But I think we're, we've, we've identified a few, uh, which I hope the task force will carry on. Anyone wants to react or should I, I will go back to some of the uh, questions in the chat. Um, Okay, so um, okay, there's there was the, the the issue of writing in English, which I think we have discussed quite a lot. Um, but also, there's there's questions concerning the idea of what constitutes anthropology in a which is implicated in a hegemonic ways of thinking. Um, but there's also questions, there's other questions which I think are not as, irre as relevant, such as, for instance, the fact that in most countries now to have a BA or a master's does not allow uh, people to, to, to go on in their careers, they need a PhD, but that's not just anthropology, that's in most of the sciences nowadays. You do need a higher degree in order to be able to practice 
and to to make yourself known. So I think that I really think the hegemony problem does not come from that, but it comes from the ways that um, different countries play different roles and how we in our own countries can really uh, address this. And I, I go back to the issue I mentioned before, which is what do we do? Not talking about American or British anthropologists, but what do we do in other countries if we quote only indigenous anthropologists, let's call them that way, uh, people from the country in itself. For instance, uh, let me ask Gustavo, what happens in Brazil if you write a paper and you want to, even if you write the paper in English, that's the point, and you only cite, you only quote, and you only talk about work done by Brazilian anthropologists, which of course may happen as you are a, many anthropologists and you do work a lot in the field, what would happen then? Um, yeah. Gustavo, are you there? No, Gustavo left a while ago. Uh, oh, so he left already. Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't. I didn't understand that. I did I saw that blurred. he was muted, but I didn't think he was there. He was. Just he had left. Make one point based on what you said. The big problem I think we face here is that there is enough intellectual difference as to what the problem is and how to address the problem. That how practically to deal with it, it remains an open question. And I'm a little confused now. I want to make a task force, but there is significant difference here as to, for example, anthropology or anthropologies, uh, for example, whether uh, Anglo-American hegemony is in some sense a gift, as James is saying in a, in a way, or whether this is an enormous problem. This is going to be tough to overcome. And, and I think in a global sense, we can, but we do see some significant intellectual differences at the basis that make a practical dealing with it globally difficult. Yes, of course, certainly. Certainly, but I think that's that's one of the points of having us deal with it at the WCA, right? Of course, of course. Which is to try to bring us together, even if we have, as we as if we have disparate opinions on on things. That's that's the richness of of it, right? Of course. If we all agreed the same way, it would not be as interesting. I think. <laughs> of course. Um, I don't know if I don't know if um, oh Gustavo, Gustavo is back. Gustavo is back. I don't know if you heard me, Gustavo. I had a very practical uh, question, which is, okay, what would happen hypothetically in Brazil if a Brazilian anthropologist would write a text, a paper in English, only quoting Brazilian anthropologists and not, you know, quoting, not referring to the work done by British or American anthropologists in Brazil? What would happen? Um, I, uh, you mean uh, to publish in Brazil or to publish everywhere? Elsewhere. No, no, no. I, I, I was thinking of publishing in the wider international anthropological community, because uh, this goes back to the issue we were discussing, you know, of, 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 of referring to colleagues that are in the field and are indigenous or, you know, national anthropologists. What would happen? Probably that, well, I don't want to answer. Let me, let me have you answer. Well, I think it depends on the quality of the paper. First of all, we we we, we should not uh, make a confusion that just because we we out uh, of the hegemonic centers, uh, we are great anthropologists. Uh, I, I mean, if if uh, you know, the, as as you mentioned before, the the the, the Brazilian epistemic community is very dense, so there are many uh, uh, interesting. Uh, um, discussions and debates that uh, are, are being done uh, in, in, in Portuguese. So if that translates well, uh, the complexity and, and, and the validity of, of the discussions, I think there, there wouldn't be uh, that big a problem. But of course, it has to do with the kind of editor that uh, we read the paper. And this is something that uh, we still have uh, to work on, on, on a global level because most editors have also uh, a provincial vision. Uh, uh, but anyhow, having said that, I think that we, we are at least uh, two decades 
uh, talking about uh, these issues. And there is a growing consciousness among anthropologists and sometimes among other social scientists too, that uh, we need to, to have a more plural vision of what is being done, uh, do, is being doing, uh, is being done in the world. Uh, and, and, and this is something that uh, really has changed, not uh, dramatically, I mean, it's not uh, all the way uh, through how Regina is always calling the attention, oh, but nobody in the US, uh, I know, but uh, although the US is the center, it's not the only place in the world. We can live uh, also without the, the US community. Uh, and, uh, but uh, as I said in, in, in other occasions, uh, we also need to change the center. Uh, and and there, there are a lot of people that are interested in doing that. Virginia is exactly. Uh, exactly. So, I mean, it's, it's an ongoing uh, process. Uh, it won't happen like this. Uh, bec why? Because again, uh, to, to finish with what I started with, it's because hegemony is an objective process. Uh, so uh, this is why we have always to be uh, debating and discussing uh, these issues. Thank you so much. Uh, we have two hands up, Virginia and Dorothy. Right. And I, I was also, uh, is it Virginia? Yeah, um, a quick question, although I don't know that it's a quick answer. I'm, I'm thinking again about some, some practical things we could do, but I don't know what people think of this. Uh, what if an intermediate step were to, in a sense, de-emphasize Anglo-American hegemony and have maybe three, four, five other centers. Uh, I know that people in smaller countries or smaller anthropological communities would not benefit from that, but would that be a useful intermediate step? It's a question. Uh, Virginia, if I got it correctly, you are um, you are suggesting that we elect four or five bigger centers beyond the US, is that it? Is that, did I get Yeah, it right? I wouldn't say elect, but let's say if if we focus on work, you know, the larger okay. places. Um, okay. Examples, Brazil, Mexico, okay. All right. or, or I don't know. Um, okay, so bef yeah. before, before having our participants answer that, let's have Dorothy. She yeah. has her hand up, Dorothy then. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just wanna say briefly that I think, um, Gustavo had brought it up uh, earlier in the discussion, uh, the really um, different levels of complexity here. So if we're talking about hegemony, uh, it's not just global north, global south uh, counterpose that, you know, even within uh, a given, for example, national context, there are hegemonic dynamics. And, and I want to um, add to that simply by saying we need to keep a kind of intersectional perspective open, I wouldn't want the discussion um, as important as it certainly is about global uh, dynamics. Uh, I wouldn't want that to overshadow uh, or become an excuse for other types of hegemonies to play out on different levels. Um, in, in the chat, somebody's uh, brought up, uh, for example, the master's students and, and you know we have a huge problem of precarity in, in the field. Um, uh, Michelle uh, brought up class hegemony, so uh, I invite uh, us to keep, uh, we can talk about gender, and uh, we were talking about citational practices, obviously a huge uh, issue uh, for women, for uh, people of color, women of color, etc. So um, just to add complexity to complexity, but it's, it's I think, important to have that uh, somehow in the background. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you very much, Dorothy. It is indeed. And, and I must say that the next uh, WCA webinar sometime late January or February will address the gender issue in anthropology. And I'm sure uh, that will be also discussed there, the gender hegemony in, in academics and especially in anthropology. But uh, as you said, there are there's it, it's there's a lot of complexities. The, some of the things you mentioned have actually been uh, dealt with in other WCA webinars. And of course there's class hegemony, there's the gender hegemony, et cetera. But I think in this webinar 
specifically. We were trying to address the issue of hegemony in a more, well, having to do with the discipline and the world anthropologist, because as you said yourself, if we go into those details, then we really get lost and we already have a lot to think about. And, and, and um, the issue that Michelle brought up and that you also brought up of uh, master students, uh, precarity, et cetera. Yes, it is something we will definitely, I think, address in an upcoming uh, WCA webinar also. So uh, we've been here one hour, 45 minutes. Normally this webinars take one and a half hour, two hours tops. So I, I really want to ask if more people want to have the floor or if uh, other, other ones think that we should go back to some of the questions and comments on the chat. And some of them have already been approached here. Please, uh, does anyone have more comments, questions? Of course, it is impossible, literally impossible, to deal with all the aspects of uh, hegemony and world anthropologists in one and a half hour. I think this is just to create the appetite to join the task force and also to reflect on, on such problems and, and together try to overcome them, or at least overcome some of them. I think anything we can do in a positive way is already a gain. Okay, I, I, but I really do want, whether it's in the chat or here orally, uh, to know what people think of my idea. It's just one of several. Would it, right. help? Would it help to have? Since you mentioned, since you mentioned two uh, communities I know, uh, like the Mexican and the Brazilians, they are very big. Uh, the, the, the Brazilian association is now uh, basically the second largest in the world. It's National Congress uh, um, may have some uh, like 4,000 people, sometimes uh, 4,000 and 500 uh, people. Uh, you know, the AAA Congress is 5,000, 6,000. Uh, and uh, I'm studying Mexican anthropology and its global influence. I just wrote a, a paper uh, on this and, and, and it's really notorious. Uh, I mean, uh, the influence of Mexican anthropology in Latin America and on the first half uh, uh, of uh, the 20th century is huge uh, because of the indigenismo, indigenism. Uh, the, the Mexican, Mexican anthropologists were, were highly related to the revolution's uh, ideals and became very close to the Mexican state that propelled their national influence and international influence, and uh, very much so in the U.S. Most of the the indigenous policies of of the U.S. in the 30s, 40s, and 50s were were based on Mexican uh, uh, anthropological interpretations, things that most people don't know, uh, and, and not to say. Uh, the, the, the kind of um, networks that uh, came out of Mexico uh, uh, in the US and, and in, in Europe. So I'm, 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 what I'm saying is I'm trying to, to show that the, 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 the flows uh, of, of knowledge uh, on a global scale are, are much more complicated uh, than uh, we think uh not only because of the networks the real networks uh, social networks that anthropologists uh, build but also uh, it has to do with size again i mean mexico is a, an anthropological paradise with its uh, archaeological past and, and it's a very sizable indigenous population there are 11 million people in mexico that uh, identify them as indigenous uh, and so forth. So yes, uh, it, 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 but uh, nonetheless, uh, this is not a big issue here in, in, in Mexico, you know, internationalization and uh, it, it is a big issue in Brazil, but not, not in Mexico. And I'm not sure why. What would colleagues from other small countries uh, like like Portugal? I think 
I, I, I must say, I don't fully agree with Virginia because that would create other hegemonies. And of course, like I said, we Portuguese go along with the Brazilians, but what happens for instance, in countries like Italy or Sweden, where, where the community is small? I mean, alliances would not work there, I think, I don't know. Alexander wants to say something, uh, Clara. Yes, please, please, Alexander, yes. Thank you so much for, uh, for uh, this discussion. I'm Alexander Horstmann from um, FAO, from the Friedrich Alexander University in Germany. Um, and I increasingly also work outside of university, actually, in political education. And I'm very interested in working with communities. And I think that um, universities have to learn. Uh, there's a, I think we have, a, as Maria also pointed out, um, we have to go out of our shelves in a way and build closer cooperation with the communities we work with. Um, often we work with communities for decades, right? And so we know them well, we invest into languages, et cetera. We invest into partnerships. And I think our research is also a, a form of intervention, of social intervention. And we like to contribute to social justice as well. So this goes beyond uh, the publication, right? This goes much beyond the, um, the publication. I think we need to produce knowledge that is more relevant to communities, that, that is community sensitive. And at the same time, I, I really, I join initiatives like Ilusir in Oxford that brings local communities much stronger into teaching, uh, into education, and into, 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 into teaching. I like initiatives also who, um, um, who brings in local knowledge and expertise, for example, for migrant and refugee communities. Um, that's a topic that I'm also very interested in, into teaching as well, stronger into teaching as well. So I think, um, um, there are plenty of things, there are plenty of opportunities actually, uh, but, but it seems that, that we, in the university we live in a kind of cage that, that doesn't allow us uh, sometimes um, to benefit from all these opportunities or, you know, that's, yeah, that's what I want to express. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a last intervention by Philippe Shana. Philippe Hanna, sorry. Yes. You, have, yes. you have raised your hand. Hello, Maria. Good, good afternoon, everybody. I'm actually a Brazilian anthropologist. I'm uh, now currently based in the Netherlands, uh -huh. which uh, <laughs> doesn't have much anthropology at all. It's very limited. So I'm actually uh, teaching in a department of cultural geography, for instance. And uh, something I see, I work a lot uh, on more applied side of anthropology. I work a lot as a consultant on impact assessment and so and uh, I've been arguing for, for this kind of uh, studies, for example, when, as I see a lot of these international consult consultants, as, as they call it, social consultants, they go to places, stay there a few days and write a report about a, a particular context. And I've been arguing a paper I'm writing, say, look, we need to, to use local anthropologists that know the affected group that can much easier uh, get an insight on a particular context in order to, to assess impacts of a particular project. But the issue is that many times the anthropological community is not interested in joining this kind of uh, for-profit projects or any kind of projects that are since development projects whatsoever, the, that we as anthropologists tend to close ourselves in our own community and deny this kind of interactions with other disciplines. But, uh, but this sort of uh, arrangement or this kind of initiative that, that I'm proposing in general to, to foster more dialogue with these other uh, disciplines and uh, try to, to collaborate on this, uh, let's say, uh, interdisciplinary in research initiatives or applied uh, anthropological uh, research. All right, thank you very much. I think that goes with uh, some of the things that Gonzalo wrote in the chat, the need for a revolution <laughs> and this revolution to be joined by other disciplines uh, on Germany. So I don't know if Gonzalo has anything else to say uh, to finish with, Gonzalo or no? Yeah, um, just um, the rules are clear. So what can we make with the rules? It's our own responsibility. So we know that there is a way and it doesn't matter that's a way we can try at least 
to think and try to change it. That's all my question about the revolutionary, as I was saying before. Thank you, Clara. All right. Thank you very much. Well, it's almost 1 a.m. for our colleague Takami in Japan, and we've been here almost two hours. So it's been a very fruitful discussion, a very fruitful debate. I think uh, we could stay here for hours because there's always new things. Um, but I, I basically want to thank everyone, the participants and the people who intervened and who wrote on the chat for all this uh, the interesting discussion. And uh, as we said in the beginning, this will be available within the next few days in the WCA WOW website, the, the recorded um, version. And uh, we look forward to you all joining us or uh, giving our, your input to the task force that Gordon is creating. And we will hopefully also see you all here in the next uh, webinar on gender in January, late January or the beginning of February. It will be communicated through the usual means. And thank you so much, everyone. Have a good day, a good afternoon or a good night and sleep well for those who are in the eastern part of the world. Thank you so much and goodbye. Bye bye.